Welcome back, I am John P. Today, I am going to be answering your questions that you have asked me on my Instagram, The Real John P. From time to time, I, well actually more than time to time, I actually receive questions all of the time, but from time to time, I just am either not able to respond in a timely fashion, or they're much more applicable uh, or useful to everyone out there in the world, so I will scrape that, and I make videos where I talk about today especially, Rolex, watches as investments, prices going up, prices going down, Cartier, and a whole number of other questions that I think would be really interesting and maybe educational from the perspective of a watch dealer with DelrayWatch.com where we buy, sell, trade watches where we have this kind of unique perspective in the watches that we trade for enthusiasts and I can share with you these things and these trends that we do observe there. So without further ado, let's jump into it. The first question, I have my laptop here just off camera, is what are your thoughts on Cartier Santos as an investment? Well, I will say right away, I don't necessarily recommend watches as an investment. I'm not an investment professional, but I feel like there are things out there that you could probably consider before watches. Now, many watches have had uh, you know, certain gains or increases in prices, but without a strategy to kind of liquidate those watches and realize those gains, not as a watch dealer, it might not be the best way to do it, right? It, there are oftentimes very high seller fees when you go to sell a watch on different online platforms. So in terms of this particular watch, I would say the Cartier Santos, unless you get one that's kind of special, maybe like a platinum, a platinum Santos Dumont or one that's gonna be coming out soon with those uh, kind of intricate enamel or the lacquer bezels that I also would love to have in my collection as well, Aside from that, a normal Cartier Santos is really not going to probably see much upside. Most likely a lot of downside considering these are really um, basically mass produced watches. Nice watches, good watches, but at the same time, nothing unique or special to necessarily warrant a huge upside uh, potential in the watch. So next question is, I'm looking to spend 9,000 US dollars on a gold dress watch and sell it in a few years without losing. Well, this is something I hear all the time. It's something that's developed, especially with the whole watches as alternative assets trend that was being kind of floated around there uh, in kind of the media dockets out there. I think the Wall Street Journals of the world. Well, um, while this may be a trend, sometimes, especially in precious metals and definitely in this price range and under in terms of precious metals, probably going to lose something unless that particular watch just happens to be a home run. And that's kind of rare in this segment, uh, especially for a dress watch. Dress watches, with some exceptions, like a Longunzona, really don't see a whole lot of upside. Also, there's some Patek Philippe's that will see that, but in this price range, you know, if you wanna kind of limit the downside, I think probably something like an H Moser, you might be able to get an older, uh, the 38 or the 39 millimeter H Moser Mayu, uh, which kind of became, um, I believe, the Endeavor, model line, you might be able to get one of those pre-owned on a marketplace online. And I don't think you'll take a hit because H. Moser produces limited quantity of their watches and they seem to be doing a pretty great job. But I think once you get away from that precious metals, especially precious dress watches in this range and under, don't really uh, seem to perform that well in terms of pricing increases. Now, next question. Now, this one's very interesting. This is going to be about Aventurine dials, kind of that starry sky look dial. This is gonna be, this person wants to know if they should either pick up or purchase the A. Langunzona uh, Saxonia Thin uh, with the Aventurine dial or the H. Moser Aventurine Moon, which one is going to retain more value? Now, <laughs> once again, another, another value question. Although I just recommended H. Moser at that kind of price point, if you could find one, when compared with something like an Elangun Zona, and we're talking about watches here that are about three times the price point, uh, depending on where you get it, box and paper, so on and so forth, uh, then the previous question, in this condition, or this case rather, really the Elangun Zona is probably more likely to retain the value. There's longer history, track record, bigger company behind Elangun Zona, and th they've really kind of put themselves into that Holy Trinity-esque region of watches today with the branding of the A. Longwood Zona where H. Moser is still kind of this like young, fun, hip rebel that makes great watches fully in-house, but 
in terms of uh, kind of the amount of time in the market to be able to really say for sure where, where they'll be in, I don't know, 10 years time, maybe not as predictable as something like a Langunzona, but we're talking at a higher price point here, and H. Moser kind of gaps that difference a little bit different than the previous question. Now, this one, I can't believe it, but this person says that they see out there in the market a Rolex Air King, the 116900 at $4,000. Is this a deal? Yeah, I think this is a deal, right? The retail was what, 6200 I don't, I think maybe five years ago, I saw this watch, horrible condition, absolutely beat to shreds, maybe $4,900 in a whole different world, essentially, in terms of watch markets. Today, forget it, $4,000. I think probably here, if you see this watch at $4,000, it's probably too good to be true. And generally when a Rolex watch especially is priced too good to be true, considering all the data that's available to anyone on Google, everyone has Google, you can find out what a watch is kind of worth within a margin of error. To see it this low doesn't make sense, probably uh, look into that a little bit further. And the same goes for any kind of hot watch, Rolex watches, Patek Philippe, things that should not be priced that much lower. Now, next we have a first watch question. I love these, I love these so much. This is a question, should they purchase for their first watch a Mido Ocean Star or the Squale Sub 39? Now, both of these brands seem to be producing okay watches right now. Squale has kind of this cult following. They've been kind of long standing in a way, but Mido has been revitalized. They've come out with some pretty cool offerings as well. Some more hip and funky uh, versions of their vintage watches. But when compared with these for a first watch, I don't know that personally I would recommend these. I wouldn't recommend these to a friend and that's what I would really be considering you here for this question. Uh, mostly because of the the lack of these really being widespread out there. They've been hitting, hitting the market by storm recently, but I, I would say just not enough uh, feedback out there. Even personally, these are watch brands that don't get traded a whole lot, which means the sales volume among enthusiasts is not that high. But instead, what I would say is, why not go for an Oris, right? Go for an Oris Aquis. This is kind of uh, the go-to entry-level dive watch, I would say. Oris is doing phenomenal things. They care about the collectors. That's where they focus. You can find endless Instagram posts and watch collecting forums. Oris seems to be where it's at at that price point, especially if you get pre-owned when you get into a new watch. Uh, so about the same price as these other aforementioned watches, but a little bit more tested in the watch enthusiast community. I personally could stand behind Oris doing good things. Or maybe would I even recommend a Seiko for a fraction of the price, right? Think a Seiko 5 Sport Diver watch, half the price, and I would say, yeah, not gonna be there in terms of quality per se, but you might find that you end up wearing this watch more in the future out of nostalgia uh, when you've collected more watches as opposed to maybe the Mido or the Squale is in that price point where you might feel at a certain point compelled to sell it in exchange getting something uh, a little bit different. That's kind of what I see happen. So the Seiko always manages to stay in watch collectors' collections when it's one of their first watches. Now next, what do you think about Jacques Adro? This one is interesting, right? So Jacques Adro is one of the more prestigious brands or aimed to be a prestigious brand from Swatch Group. It's gone through many different versions and they've gone defunct decades ago, they've switched hands. This is very common, especially with the brands that Swatch Group has purchased, Swatch Group owning uh, the like of the Etta watch movement manufacturer, as well as Omega, and so many others. But interestingly enough, they do make really fine watches, especially for the Swatch Group. Now, this there's gonna be some more complicated, some more higher end pieces that maybe Swatch, you know, got the parts from other speci specialty manufacturers in Switzerland uh, or other parts of the world, but they haven't really reached it there in terms of branding, in my opinion, to warrant the types of prices that they're asking on these watches. I would try to get a pretty steep discount in the range of 35% uh, off. Um, interestingly enough, if you've seen the movie House of Gucci, uh, the company that was brought in as the investors, the Invest Corp, was known for kind of this thing, and they actually owned part of Jacques Adro in a while, and they kind of approached it in the same way. So if you see the movie House of Gucci and kind of what that company did, 
with Gucci. Kind of the same thing happened with uh, Jacques Edro before it became part of Swatch Group, interestingly enough. So really, pretty good watches. Some of the best, depending on the model, for Swatch Group. Uh, but the pricing, in my opinion, needs to be pulled back just a little bit for it to be worth it compared to other brands out there in the market, considering the actual branding. Now next, where do you get the bracelets for your rowing blazer Seiko? So I, I have a rowing blazers collaboration, this clothing company with the Seiko watch, and it has this, uh, oh, it's actually right here, it has this like Jubilee-esque bracelet on it. Actually, there's an Amazon store uh, that sells Seiko things, right? Seiko watches, Seiko bracelets, and there's a bracelet that fits this watch. Um, this watch doesn't come on this bracelet. It comes on more of the Oyster style, but uh, you can you know, you know, can kind of swap some of these bracelets out. It's actual Seiko bracelets, so check that out. I'm in no way affiliated with the brand or Amazon for that matter, uh, but they're out there, and it's actually not a bad bracelet. Gives it kind of more of that, uh, maybe more sophisticated look compared to an Oyster. Now, next question is, which discontinued Panerai watches would you recommend? Now, it really just depends what you're looking to do, but personally, I would probably recommend pre-Vendome. So this is gonna be 93 to about 96, 1993 to 1996, when Panerai really re-hit the scene, had the uh, kind of the infamous partnership with Sylvester Stallone and the Sly, uh, the Sly Tech watches, and also they had the original Mare Nostrum watch, the Chronograph, which I think is just so cool. So if you can manage to get yourself a, uh, a pre-Vendome and maybe even a pre-Richemont, Richemont now owns Panerai, if you can kind of get the Panerai from that era, I think maybe these will become collectible once again, especially when they become true vintage. And personally, I like the original Mare Nostrum chronographs because it doesn't look like a modern Panerai. All the modern Panerai chronographs today look like all the other Panerais, at least the cases, and these are a little bit different, and that's what I like about it. So you have the, um, there'll be a couple pictures here, but I would I would kind of try to go for these Mare Nostrum watches. I think that they could be maybe like a cult classic type of watch, but time will really tell. Now next, hi, hello. I have a Rolex sub, and I'm thinking about getting a Speedy. So they're gonna get an Omega Speedmaster, and they're curious here, if having two watches of the same color in their collection in that way, a black Submariner and a black Speedmaster, is that going to be an issue for them? They're looking at an IWC Pilot chronograph in blue. Uh, they're looking at a green Breitling chronomat, not sure which one. And they're also, of course, looking at the Speedmaster. Is this gonna be a problem? What should they do? Well, it all depends on you, right? I can't tell you, hey, buy a watch of this color, buy a watch of that color. Personally, I think both of these watches are iconic watches, right? What's more iconic than the Speedmaster? Maybe the Daytona. What's more iconic than the Submariner? Maybe the Daytona. Regardless, the color, is that an issue? They're both iconic watches, different complications compared to the Submariners that I've watched. The Speedmaster's a chronograph. One went to the moon, one went to the ocean, or so many other countless places, right? Uh, so it's really up to you. I don't have a problem with it uh, because if you are a watch collector, it might not be about matching the shoes to the watch, matching your, your jacket to the watch or something like that where fashion might play more into it. If you like watches, both of these watches are iconic and I don't think you should overlook one of them because they're the same color. So this has been a collection of questions that you've asked me on my Instagram, the real John P. I've answered many of them, but there are still some others that I will reserve for a future video. And also, if you have any other questions, please feel free, and it's really welcome to leave them down below in the comments or send me the direct messages in the future. I will put them in a video or respond if I think it's something that's a little more timely or that you really, really need help with. I generally respond to those things, but a lot of these questions I see over and over again from fellow collectors like you, so I do put them together here where we can all kind of chime in together in the comments below. Guys, please do not forget to check out delraywatch.com where we buy, sell, and trade watches. And we'll see you next time. You've been chatting with John P.